I say it's great to have a good have a good geeks around. So I'd like to welcome you to our September annual South Carolina Native Plant Upstate Zoom meeting, where we work to make the world a better place, <clears throat> one native plant at the time. So our membership, let me get some of this stuff off my screen. <laughs> uh, the whole state has 915 members. I wonder if that's a record. I think maybe it might be. I think so. Uh, upstate has 455. Low Country has 216. Midlands has 141. Piedmont has 47. South Coast has 56. Um, I want to uh, make a couple of announcements here. The state symposium will open its registration later on this week on the website. So please check that out. Um, thanks go to all the folks in the upstate nursery group who have worked diligently through the years, through this year, and will be instrumental, instrumental in getting our plants out going. That's October 1 through 22nd. Our active projects for the past year are Janie's Prairie, Fig Buttercup Eradication, Parks Mill Pro Progress. That continues to be active last month. We saw Bill Stringer tell us all about the things that are doing with the building. Some people have questioned our a reason for working so on the building. But if we let that building go, I feel like it's saying we don't really care about the spot. And so we are promoting keeping this historic building for its valuable and rare plants that are around this property. Um, we've had our plant surveys, our invasive removal projects, and plant rescues have been conducted in several locations. Um, as I said, our days, and this is an online fall sale, so people will order their plants and then pick them up at the nursery. Um, we need plant, plant sale volunteers. Um, the special week that is low on volunteers is October the 13th <clears throat> through 18th. Um, the morning shifts except on October the 15th in the afternoon. If you can volunteer, please contact Kathy Harrington at her email address, which is farmcat1965 at gmail. Um, the plant list will be on the website in the next few days. So our nominating committee met and that consisted of Betsy George, Kathy McCurdy, Judy Seeley, and Dan Whitten. And they submit the following slate of officers for two-year uh, two terms for our board of directors. Pam Barber for president, Chris Sermons for vice president, Susan Lockridge for secretary and John Heigl for treasurer. If there are no nominations from the general membership uh, by October the 31st, new officers will take office November the 1st. If there are nominations, we will need to send out ballots and they will be uh, counted and December the 1st will be the deadline and then the officers will take place, uh, will take the job in December. Wow. Okay. So, Rick, I turn this over to you to introduce our speaker as if we didn't know who he is. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Virginia. Great, great little update on our plant society uh, endeavors. Um, you know, we as a society uh, been in, around here for 26 years, I guess, working on it. And it's always an honor to uh, do what we do. Uh, it's a calling, I would say. 
And, uh, and so what you, when we transfer over from leadership uh, from one to the other, what we, what I always like to say, we have a coalition of the willing, uh, those who are willing to serve uh, our effort and what we do. And again, like Virginia said, make the world a better place one native plant at a time. So it's, uh, it's quite an honor tonight to, as the programming director for the upstate chapter to introduce our speaker tonight. And, uh, you know, uh, Patrick and I uh, have gone back for so many years to this plant society. Those uh, Sundays down at, uh, down at the USC, down at John Nelson's uh, herbarium down there, meeting on Sundays and hashing out native plant stuff and uh, goes way back. So, and then many, many times in the field and all the things that we've been uh, grouped and associated with over the years. So it's quite an honor here. Uh, so I give a little bit of bio here and I'm gonna turn it loose to Patrick. I, try, I said I was going to tell Patrick stories, but I'm not. So, uh, but, uh, so let's get started. I can tell stories all night. But um, so Patrick received his BS in biology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his PhD in biological science from Clemson University. Dr. Ramilla was the lead author in the new publication, A Guide to the Wildflowers of South Carolina, which he has co-authored with Dr. Richard Prochet, Dr. Doug Rayner, and David Y. Currently, uh, Patrick is the director of the J Juniper Level Botanical Garden in Raleigh, North Carolina. He was formerly the director of the Hearns Wood Garden in Kings Kingston, West uh, Washington. He is the Emmy uh, went, Award winner, host of the, and create co-creator and writer of the popular ETV Nature Program Expeditions with Patrick Millen. For over 20 years, Patrick has worked as a professional naturalist, biologist, and educator. His range of experience has con concentration on botany, though he is also well respected throughout his work in, uh, I can't say that word, herpetology and mammalogy. Uh, so, uh, and Patrick is a professional naturalist and served uh, as the Glenn and Heather Hiller uh, Professional Environment of Sustainability at Clemson University, where he was also a faculty member in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation and the director of the South Carolina Botanical Garden, Bob Candle, Campbell Geology Museum, and the Clemson Experimental Forest, and as an honorary member of the Clemson University class of 1939. But you know, these uh, bios that you read do not even come close to saying all the values that Patrick brings uh, to the world and his knowledge that he shared through expeditions for 20 years, you know, it's just been phenomenal. So it's quite an honor to have Patrick here tonight to speak to us as a friend and as a comrade of Native Plants. Patrick, floor is yours, buddy. <laughs> Love you, Rick. Thank you. Well, let's see if I can figure out how to do this again. I've gotten out of the habit of doing Zoom, so whoops. Is that showing the screen? It is? Okay. All right. Good, good. Now i got to figure out how to get us out of here. All right. Um, so it is a, a real pleasure to, uh, to speak to you tonight about um, the book that, uh, believe it or not, is actually in print. <laughs> I didn't think this would ever happen, it seemed. Um, we, um, we started this project on this book in February of 2020. And I got a call from Richard Pache and uh, Richard said, hey, we need to update the book. The USC Press wants us to update the book. And I said, well, I, I'd, I'd be interested in helping you update the book. And um, we talked to USC Press and we started to update it. And then we decided that uh, maybe what we should do rather than just update it is to make an entirely new edition um, that preserves a lot of the a uh, lot of the the most popular, the best things out of the the first book. Um, but really updated it to where we are now, updated it taxonomically, um, updated it in terms of conservation, um, and included a lot more species, because as you know, I suffer from ADD and OCD, and together those two things mean you, you just, you, you can't sit still, and you need to do all you can, and you need to include all you can, and need to make, make a book that weighs about 3.45 pounds. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, um, I set about starting this and within a week, um, the world shut down. 
Uh, we all got sent home uh, at Clemson University. And uh, it, it just so happened that the horrors that we've been through the last two years uh, dealing with the COVID epidemic or pandemic um, facilitated the production of this book. USC Press uh, set a, a really uh, sharp deadline. They wanted this book, all the text for this book to be done by um, July 31st of 2020. So that was only a couple months to, to get in there and really what we had thought at the time, update the book. Um, by the time we, we really got going on it, we realized we were gonna end up with a, a very similar format, a very similar content. Um, but an entirely revised edition. And that's, that's what we ended up producing. And it did not happen by July 31st. It happened by September 30th, which was the last day that I uh, lived in South Carolina before I, I set off for, for Washington State. And from that time on, we've been working on, uh, on getting this thing into an actual book. And I can't tell you what it was like to come home on Saturday night and see that uh, that it actually exists. So that was that was pretty exciting for me. And um, the talk I'm going to talk, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, I, I'm going to talk to you about this book from my perspective. Um, and my perspective on the book is as um, <laughs> lead author, and with the things that I that I contributed to the book, and the things and the directions that my own life's experiences take me in this book. Um, I would highly suggest that you invite the other authors in to also speak about their, uh, their angles, their contribution and their expertise in this book. Um, there's three contributing uh, authors to this book and a contributing author who we could not have done the book without. And that's David White, who was my videographer at Clemson for you know, almost two decades working with expeditions, but he's also an incredible, um, incredible talent dealing with uh, the production of, of visuals of all kinds. So as you'll see, the things that we added into this book and the, the design and the quality of the photographs in this book, it wouldn't have been possible without David White. So we, we I know we all three are incredibly indebted to him um, being the point person um, not just contributing photos, but also um, taking what we had done, and in some cases, even resurrecting the worst photo I could possibly take into something that's usable in, in a book format. So um, just so you know, if you do purchase this book, um, all of the proceeds that we as authors receive from this book, um, not a penny of it comes to any of us. So we, we all decided uh, very early on in the project that we would donate all of those proceeds to uh, the conservation education outreach um, that takes place at the South Carolina Botanic Garden and at Wofford College. So if you enjoy the Natural Heritage Garden at the South Carolina Botanical Garden that um, staff and I worked so hard to, uh, to build, uh, what I think is probably the greatest natural community garden of, of any size anywhere, um, purchasing this book, the proceeds, the profits from that that would have come to us, are, they're going to go there. Or Doug's profits will go to uh, Wofford College to support the same actions that we all care about. And that's preserving, protecting, and promoting um, native plants. So a little bit about what it means to me to do a book with Richard Porsche. I met Dr. Porsche. In the low country of South Carolina, I can tell you exactly where I was in the low country of South Carolina. I was on a little um, country store in Williamsburg County at Crossroads. And I had spent oh, about an hour before that out on a private hunt club with Dr. Porsche uh, and Dr. Pete, who is my professor at the uh, University of North Carolina, and Eric Kelmark. Um, who I worked with as a postdoc on a project surveying the longleaf pine habitats of uh, the South Carolina coastal plain. And I was kind of uh, starstruck initially because I'd heard about this Dr. Porsche. I'd seen this Dr. Porsche give uh, lectures at the Association for Southeastern Biologists. 
And I'd watched him up there with that cane that he used at the lecture and pounding that cane in the ground. I tell you, Schwabia Americana is the most common in South Carolina of any state within its range. And I'm like, wow, this guy's like, he's something. <laughs> I knew he was a character. Um, well, we got ourselves some chicken and we sat on the back stoop of that uh, old country store. And Richard was taking photographs at that time for the first of his wildflower books, for the Guide to the Wildflowers of the South Carolina Low Country and the Lower PD. And Richard sat down next to me. Now I'm a little punk kid at this time and nervous. I mean, my gosh, was I nervous. He sat down next to me and he says, you seem to know your plants. I said, I try, sir. He says, well, I got three questions for you. Now I'm expecting questions about, you know, polygola nana, something like that, that we'd seen that day. And he says, how do you pronounce H-U-G-E-R? And I said, well, that'd be huge, sir. He said, you are correct. He says, what do you call that mud when you walk out in the salt marsh oozes up between your toes? I said, well, that'd be pluff mud, sir. He says, you are correct. He says, are you a Democrat or a Republican? I thought, oh, my Lord, here I am in South Carolina. I said, so I really don't like to get political with things. But, you know, I am from Chapel Hill, if that tells you anything. He says, Hot damn, I knew there was something I liked about you. And my life since that day to this day has started out near every morning. And I guarantee you, if I show you on this phone, I'll tell you, nearly every morning, it starts out getting a call uh, from that man. So he's a mentor to me. Um, and he's been very much like a father for my entire professional life. And, uh, incredibly meaningful to be able to do a book with Dr. Porsche. Um, so often I was in a position to contribute to his other books, um, but it was a real honor to be asked to lead this one. So i um, very proud of the fact that I have a book with Dr. Porsche. Well, let's talk about what in the world's in this book, um, the nature of our wildflowers. South Carolina has some impressive numbers. And I have to, to give a little thanks here too, because I worked with, uh, not, not just with the authors in this book, but with nearly everybody who was doing botany in South Carolina at any time that was still alive. They were involved with one realm or the other, this book. And um, very, very closely worked with um, our state botanist, Keith Bradley, and with um, Alan Weekly at, at the University of North Carolina. And after the last update, um, right before the book uh, was finished being written, which all of our taxonomy, everything, all the information in the book follows the 2020 version of, of Weekly. We thought it would, this book would be out in 2021. When it didn't come out till 2022, it, it, it puts a wrinkle in things. <laughs> but um, because Alan has just published his 2022 version, which has some changes from the 2020 version that I would have liked to have had in here, but didn't quite make the, the cut. Um, but at the time of, um, of us writing this book, there were 4,050 taxa. That's different species, varieties, and subspecies of plants within South Carolina. And 2,911 of those are considered native to South Carolina. There are 997 of those included in, um, in this volume of the book. Um, and in this volume of the book, each one of those 997 are included in the, the color plates. There's 1,022 color plates. And if you're wondering why there's more plates than there are species, it's because we also have illustrated the natural communities that the plants grow in within this book. Um, many, of these, um, many of these new additions of things that we've added in are newly documented for South Carolina since the first edition. So it's pretty exciting um, when you consider uh, how incredibly biodiverse our little state is. I mean, we don't have the tall mountains. We don't have spruce fir forests. We don't have northern hardwoods. We don't have beach gap forests. We don't have a lot of things that occur in the high mountains of North Carolina and Georgia. But even without that, 
in a, in a size that's uh, North Carolina is 50% larger than we are. Georgia is twice as large as South Carolina. And when you look at the numbers of taxa that are found there, 4,452, that's, that's only 402 taxa more um, than we have, given the fact that North Carolina has all that additional elevation and all that additional space. Um, 3370 in the native category for North Carolina and Georgia, twice as large as South Carolina, 4,378. So we're essentially comparable to both the other states. And if we look at a graph of the number of species by area, we're larger than they are in species per unit area. So it is a phenomenal place. And the more, the, the more mature I get, I think, in reading landscapes for wildflowers, the more I understand that South Carolina has been very fortunate among the states in the Southeast North of Florida in that it has maintained a lot more connection with the historic and um, traditional human impact and human interaction with landscape, much more so than North Carolina, much more so than Georgia. Um, here, we tend to value things like uh, prescribed fire. Um, here, it's not uncommon to drive through private property that has incredibly diverse pinelands in the low country. And that's something that just doesn't happen very often in places like the North Carolina coastal plain. So a lot of it has to do with choice. And that's always my thing is the choices we make reverberate through history. And if we care about native plants, we care about natural communities. You care about the birds, the bees, the, the beetles and the butterflies. We need to do everything we can to keep that connection intact. So species like many flower grass pink that we included in this edition um, were added in the, um, in the time that I've been working in South Carolina because we didn't realize they grew in South Carolina until we found them for the very first time right down in the Francis Marion National Forest. Well, Dr. Porche's uh, treatments, his essays uh, have been uh, revised a bit by him, but they're still there. And uh, don't fear, you'll still know how to pronounce Latin names just like Richard Porche so that you can have a Berkeley County accent too. Um, his pronunciation guide is still there and Richard did incredible work. Um, he, you know, obsessive work on the syllabization of the pronunciation for each one of these species. So you'll be able to not only see the scientific name and the common name and the scientific name, but you'll also be able to see how to break that long, confusing Latin up into small syllables that allow you to pronounce it properly, or at least enunciate it properly. Um, his essays on, uh, on carnivorous plants, updated, still there. I, I did go through and we updated those together. And you'll find more information there. Because when the first edition came out, we had no idea threadleaf sundew ever grew in South Carolina. Now, I'd love to tell you that I could show you exactly where that thing grows in Orangeburg County, but I can't because it hasn't been seen there in about 150 years. But we did discover that 150 years ago, a specimen was collected in Orangeburg County. And there's no reason to doubt that species, that specimen coming from there, because all the other things the guy collected that day are totally fit for being in Orangeburg County. So we can add another species to the list of plants that are known from South Carolina, but it unfortunately is a species that's known from South Carolina and is lost to South Carolina today. Um, and we see more and more of that, uh, no matter where you live in the world today. Um, it's, it's oftentimes much more exciting to see and be able to add new pitcher plants like the Saracenia rubra variety Viatorum down the right-hand side there, the Georgia sweet pitcher plant. We're starting to understand more and more about how this uh, group of plants we call sweet pitcher plants have speciated or begun to speciate across the landscape. So new information, even in, in those essays. And, you know, goodness gracious, I, I had to take some folks from North Carolina down to see what a real pitcher plant looked like this spring. So <laughs> we uh, did a, uh, I did a tour down to uh, a very famous place in the coastal plain of, of North Carolina. 
and everybody was doing and awing over the pitcher planes. I said, that's nothing. I said, I got waste places, old bora pits in South Carolina that look way better than that. And they said, oh, you just always talking about how great South Carolina is. Well, I took those folks down there and I think they about fell on their face when they saw the bora pit. I went and didn't even take them to the good spots because, you know, got to have something held back just for us. Well, the book is um, focused on a, an arrangement that is all about natural communities. And so natural communities are also an interesting thing. Um, we talk about them. And if you're not familiar with natural communities, if, if you've been in Native Plant Society, you probably are. But um, natural communities are basically repetitive, repeated patterns we see on the landscape of plants that typically grow together and have the same structure to the habitat. Um, my definition's right up at the top up there. Um, um, if you can see it, I know screens get cluttered, but natural community I, I call an interactive reoccurring assemblage of organisms, their physical environment and the natural processes that affect them. That's my sort of oversimplified definition. And the important part there is interactive because everything in this pond cypress savanna that we're looking at here down in Berkeley County, South Carolina, looking so good this year, um, everything is interconnected with a massive ecological web and plants form the base of that web. And since a plant can't get up and walk away and not be there the next time you come there, we tend to name natural communities after the plant components that are found there. So a savanna is a tree herb community. So we have trees, widely spaced, without overlapping canopies, without a super canopy and a, a closed super canopy, a closed canopy, a closed sub canopy. They're widely spaced trees and then herbs, grasses and forbs in the understory, not very bushy. Okay? So that's a savanna and we call it a pond cypress savanna because the one of the abundant trees that is well adapted to dealing with the fire that maintains this and the fluctuating water levels is the pond cypress, right? So that's what a natural community is. And we, we hope that you learn as much about the natural community as you learn about the plants. And um, that's one of the reasons why I like having the plants in this book arranged by natural community, because it kind of forces you to understand something about the natural community, even if a plant can be found in multiple natural communities. Um, the fact that you know it occurs in, in one will help you to understand that natural community. Um, we also broached a subject in this book that, um, that we hadn't before, or we'd sort of skirted around, and that is, that, that is, I'm involved, so the human touch is going to be there. And it's the idea that our natural heritage is shared, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter where your people came from. No matter the color of your skin, no matter uh, uh, what, you, you, you have a massive connection with the landscape of the natural communities of the world. And we think about um, natural communities in terms of today, and we oftentimes ignore the past. And I know you've heard me say this many, many times, if you've watched my show or been to any talk I've done, but when we look out into an incredible natural community, like the one that I've got pictured here, of which we have 150,000 acres of in South Carolina. This is a freshwater, a tidal freshwater marsh, the most productive aquatic community on earth, meaning you can make more pounds of alligators here than anywhere else. <laughs> it creates more biomass than any other aquatic natural community that, that has been studied yet on planet earth. Um, it's also incredibly beautiful and incredibly diverse, and it's also incredibly new on the landscape. When you go down to places um, to see the biodiversity that's drawn to those incredible tidal marshes, go down to places like Donnelly and the Ace Basin and see today populations of endangered and threatened birds, birds like the wood stork that have moved up from Florida where the, the habitat got bad to a place where the habitat's still good to raise their young um, and created massive wood stork colonies in our low country um, trees that are just adjacent to these tidal marshes. I don't want you to forget where they came from. Those massive freshwater marshes used to be 
bald cypress swamp forest, tidal swamp forest. Those bald cypress tidal swamp forests were cut down. They were ditched. Um, there are a series of levees and canals were put in place. A series of gates were put in place. Rice trunk gates were put in place to farm rice, Carolina gold rice. And all of that work was done by enslaved people. So when you look out on that marsh, when you enjoy those birds, I think all of us need to reflect back upon and think about the history and all the things, horrible things, beautiful things, all the things that have happened to create the opportunity to see how life has responded to all of our choices, even the bad ones, right? And to understand that all of us have been involved in the creation of the natural communities today, and none of them were created, were assembled since the end of the last ice age without the hands of humans involved. Um, it's a little cut out of the book here of a very common wildflower, cut leaf cone flower, right? Um, but you'll notice in several places in the book, there's another name there that you may not have ever heard for this plant before. Cut leaf cone flower is also called Sochan, right? And that's a Cherokee name for this plant. Um, and we tried to include a lot more information about the connectivity of plants to the local cultures and indigenous cultures in South Carolina in this book as well. So cut leaf cone flower, Sochan, is actually collected as a, as a pot herb, as a cooked green by the Cherokee. It, it has historically been one of the most important plants um, to the Cherokee nation. And it's still collected in massive numbers today. And in fact, I was just, I had listened to a talk yesterday by Justin from the Natural Heritage Program up here, who was talking about spending time with the Cherokee and, and a study that was done on how they actually harvest the Sochan. And the way that they harvest the Sochan produces more flower spikes than an unharvested plant. So the way that they've learned to harvest the plant is, is one that provides more plant for the future. Um, and though all indigenous practices aren't like that, it'd be, it, it's, it's one that I think is uh, incredibly beautiful to think about when you see Sochan. You may be seeing plants that were at one time, not too long ago, big patch like this, very important to a Cherokee family in the upstate of South Carolina. So we really shouldn't ignore history. I mean, uh, the more, I've, more time I've spent studying natural communities around the world, the more I learn um, that the imprints of human beings are everywhere. We look into the landscape. And in the Carolinas, you know, we have areas, we have things like the longleaf pine savannas, fire maintained communities of the coastal plain that we remember and we know why Schwalbe Americana grows where it grows, because we can look at a picture of old growth longleaf pine with a grassy understory, fire scars on the stalk, and we know what that habitat looked like, okay? But there are other things, like Schweinitz's sunflower, that today, if you were asked somebody, what's the habitat of the Schweinitz's sunflower looks like? Well, I could draw it on a piece of paper here. It looks like at the side of a road somewhere in York County, doesn't it? Or underneath the power line somewhere in York County and amongst a bunch of trees, but where the power lines open, the plant grows. And we have a whole host of these things that today we know form part of, of what we call the Piedmont Prairie. And the connection, where were the Piedmont Prairies? How extensive were they? Who was responsible for their management? Was it natural? Was it lightning strikes? Was it people? Um, we've done, if you heard me talk in the past about um, the research that we've done on colonial era collections, they give us a lot of information about what South Carolina used to be like. Um, so Mark Catesby is a great case study. Um, we assume always that cowbirds are nasty invasive birds that came from out west. But the very first cowbird collected in America was collected in 1722 from Charleston, South Carolina. Huh. So cowbirds were in the Carolinas when Catesby visited. And as all we all know, cowbirds developed that 
brood parasitism that they have because they're associated with this animal, bison, and bison migrate. So if you have to stay around the bison to feed uh, on the insects and, and in the rich habitats that the bison creates, um, you don't have time to raise your own kids. So you dump them off in the nest of some other bird, right? So this is why they present problems in, in con conserving other species of our native songbirds. But in fact, they were here, which indicates that maybe the bison was here. And by golly, Mark Catesby drew a bison and underneath a pink flowered locust tree. And, you know, when I was younger, I thought Mark Catesby must be on crack or something because we don't have buffalo in South Carolina. And we, now everybody knows the pink flowered tree sized uh, Robinia grows in North Carolina and not South Carolina. Well, in fact, we did have both and we still have um, the Robinia in Aiken County growing wild, probably right where Mark Catesby saw it. But we also have <clears throat> in his descriptions is that he talks about visiting them. Um, now he's visiting the tree because he's a botanist. He doesn't really care about the bison. <clears throat> Visit them to get at the um, proper time to get some seeds, but the ravaging Indians had burned the woods many miles around. But once you get past that, you know, 18th century casual racism and start to think about what those Native Americans were actually doing, they were burning to create the habitats that created the, the uh, bison habitat that gave them the, the bison as a food resource. And in fact, Catesby talks about how his guides would hunt the bison during the, the um, uh, hunt the bison uh, during the sultry times of day because during the cool times of day they were out in the treeless savannas where there were no trees to hide behind if you wounded one instead of bring them down with the first shot. So treeless savannas, massive grasslands, places large enough for bison to roam and this is all between Charleston and Anderson, South Carolina because that's as far as Mark Catesby's experience went in the Carolinas, right? So um, this habitat that today exists mostly on roadsides and in a few places like Sioux the Prairie up here in North Carolina, which is an excellent example and Blackjack Heritage Preserve. Blackjack's Heritage Preserve near Rock Hill has little patches of this. Um, and uh, with a little bit more aggressive management, we could get a lot more of this back in that Heritage Preserve. Um, and there's a great example where this picture came from that's been recreated, not restored, but recreated on virgin soil that was never plowed with a till at the South Carolina Botanic Garden, okay? Well, we didn't burn it after the Native Americans were, were forcibly removed from the landscape. We didn't burn it. And we plowed it and we planted cotton, we planted corn, we planted tobacco, we planted rice, we planted the land. We operated what essentially was a mining operation. We were mining the soil because we were taking and exploiting everything we could get out of it. And every time we did it, we were pulling away forever a little bit more and a little bit more topsoil to the point that it became no longer profitable to farm. And with the, the arrival of the boll weevil, it wiped out most of the cotton culture. Land was abandoned. And today we have Piedmont forests of oaks and sweet gums and tulip trees and loblolly pine and we look, go out and we look at that and there's nothing very interesting growing underneath it and we think that's what's natural in the Piedmont. Well, that's a natural community, but it's only natural since it was transformed from the natural community it was before in the prairie, the cotton field, and the oak forest that we have today, all dependent on the choices of people, right? So nothing static. And there are places in South Carolina where we can go and we can get glimpses back into the past. This is a picture late in the year um, when we were doing a program on Mark Catesby of a um, post oak savanna down in the, the Long King district of the, the um, uh, National Forest. Um, and that it looks very similar to the habitats that today we associate with places like Oklahoma, but this is the habitat that we think um, really was common in South Carolina at the time Mark Catesby was here and it's where many of our rarest plants occur today. So we call these um, oak savannas. Remember we talked about the pond cypress savanna. Here we have oaks, post oaks, blackjack oaks, widely spaced, a tree 
superb community being managed by the National Forest uh, Service with fire, okay? How beautiful it was the year after a fire. Oaks are very, uh, those oaks in particular, very um, resilient to fire. So here's a picture from Oklahoma of a little grove of oaks out in Tall Grass Prairie Preserve where my son did his, uh, much of the work for his PhD. Uh, by the way, Nick's a professor now, so <laughs> very proud of him. He's a doctor, another Dr. McMillan, like we need another one of those in the world. But um, imagine the South Carolina Piedmont looking a little more like this and a little less like um, what we see over most of the abandoned agricultural community today. So in our state, here's blackjack oaks, our blackjack heritage preserve down in Rock Hill. And you can see lots of these uh, shadows of what used to be in the past, the prairie dock, uh, Silphium terebinthinaceum, um, right from the book. And believe it or not, that's our habitat shot for the book because that's the biggest patch of Piedmont Prairie on that really unusual type of rock that we have left um, in South Carolina. So lots of work we could do really um, to maybe not bring back what was here before because that may be impossible, but to bring back a diverse habitat that approximates on our new conditions habitat for all these rare things. So the arrangement is by physiographic region, just like it was um, in the first edition. And um, it's separated out into mountains, Piedmont, sand, the fall line sand hills, inner and outer coastal plain, maritime strand, and what we call the rural communities. And that's really just the wasteland, the, the weedy sites, abandoned agricultural fields. Um, heavily disturbed um, sites like interstate roadsides, backyards, places that don't fit neatly into other natural community descriptions. And at the top right side of um, each page in that section, you can find the color that matches, in this case, coastal plain, right? The inner and outer coastal plain. An example that I have here, where we see a Baptisia bracteata in the corner, it's this color, which refers to the Piedmont. So it makes it very easy to turn into this book to the right section if you just want to thumb through or flip through um, the pictures and treatments and plants from each one of those regions. And then <laughs> when you start looking at what's within there, um, you'll see that our photographs aren't just a single picture of a plant. And even though we call this a, uh, a wildflower book, our, we, we call it a wildflower book to sell more copies, really, just like the first editions. Wildflowers for us also include things that never have a flower. So ferns, yeah, they're in the wildflower book. The trees that make up the bulk of the, the structure in our forest and woodland communities, they're in the book. And whatever you need to identify that species, thanks to the, the marvel of digital photography and the ability to throw away two thirds of what you take a picture of and keep the best, we've been able to show. So instead of showing just a leaf of the Carolina shagbark hickory, Car Caria carolinae septentrionalis, I had to throw North Carolina at least one bone since I'm sitting in it. Uh, that name means North Carolina. Yeah, we have a better plant. It's Carex uh, uh, austro-caroliniana. That means South Carolina. This means North Carolina in Latin. But you can see the shaggy bark, you can see the structure of the bud, the leaf arrangement, and even uh, the tree of the nut over here on the side. Another big difference between this and, and any other book since Radford is that we have for every species an accurate county level distribution map. So <clears throat> each dot on this map means that there is an actual herbarium specimen that was collected and deposited into one of the, the museum, musea that we um, examined specimens of for this flora. Um, I looked at over 200,000 herbarium specimens to produce the range maps in the book. Um, that also would not have been possible without uh, the development of the CERNEC portal. So many of the, the um, local herbariums in the Southeast are members of the CERNEC portal um, and you can go look up and look at every specimen, digital images of every specimen that's been collected to that species. So in the process of doing this book, we have nearly 1000 ranges corrected for these species. And 
the only time that we needed to look closer to a specimen was when the characteristic could not, that distinguishes the species when I couldn't see it in the, uh, the digital image of the dried plant that I was looking at. So for the first time, we have a really good range map for these species in South Carolina. And that's pretty exciting. That's probably, the, in my opinion, the, the biggest technological leap, the biggest leap in understanding our plants that, that is made by this book is the fact that we have really accurate, and I mean really accurate, county level distribution maps for these um, these plants. Now that doesn't mean that you won't find Canby's dropwort someday in, in Georgetown County. It may grow there. It means nobody's found it to date and made an official report of it, made a, a specimen that exists in the museum. Okay. All right. So let's look at how these, this treatment is and how it might have changed. This is this is species or plate number 705, Camby's dropwort, Camby's cowbane. Most of the time we're trying to use not just one, but more than one common name because common names aren't um, formalized. They're not, uh, there's not one designated common name for any of our plants. Okay, and everybody knows since the South Carolina Native Plant Society is so heavily tied to this Camby's dropwort, we all know now that this is no longer Oxypolis cambii, right? <laughs> This is Tiedemannia cambii, okay? So a huge number of names have changed in this uh, edition versus the last. And that's because we know a lot more now about who is related to who and who needs to be in a new genus and who needs to be put into a different genus and what species need to be split apart and what new species we found. So Tiedemannia cambii, if you didn't know that and you went to the index in the back of the book, which in, in this uh, edition, um, we decided not to separate out the index. So everything is indexed together. So there's not a scientific name and a common name index. Just go to O, since you knew Oxypolis, you look up Oxypolis cambii and the synonym will take you right to the page that has the new name on it. So the first name is the accepted name as of today and corresponding to Weekly's Flora of the Southeastern US. And then look at here, if you didn't know how to say Tiedemannia, it's syllabi uh, syllabized for you here. So Tiedemannia can be I, right? And if you want to know what that means, in the comments section, the genus honors Frederick, uh, Friedrich Tiedemann, right? a French zoologist and the specific epithet honors William Canby. Um, who was the discoverer of the species, though at a point farther north than South Carolina. Um, description follows, um, similar but greatly expanded in most cases from what was in the first edition. The habitat and range, so always starting with the overall range of the plant, coastal plain from Delaware south to Georgia, in South Carolina, rare in the coastal plain in depression meadows, pond cypress savannas, and upper margins of other depression pond habitats. In this book, we chose to follow one of the conventions for common names. So pond cypress is the name of a species, Taxodium ascendens. If we talk about cypress, small c, if we're talking about a particular species, we're gonna capitalize um, all of the, the words in that species. So. Um, Camby's dropwort capitalized. Now we also give you the similar species and in almost every case we also have that similar species in um, the book somewhere. Not always but you'll find that most of the similar species species are also pictured elsewhere in the book and if it is it'll tell you where to find uh, that species. Okay comments and then the last thing way down here at the bottom I hopefully you can see it the conservation status is on all of our rare species that are included in the book. So for this one um, it's federally endangered so it has a federal status. Um, for others that are rare in South Carolina it has the South Carolina status which is either um, which is either imperiled or critically imperiled if it's considered rare in South Carolina. Okay. All right, so lots of things have changed and some things changed during the time we had submitted the manuscript and the print version came out. So this is Tiarella cordifolia in this book, it was just lumped all into one species. And now all the material in the upstate of South Carolina 
is Tiarella austrina, just described last year um, by Neesom as a new species segregated out from the rest of the foam flowers. We include common species, we have some rare species, and we even decided we wanted to include the exceptionally rare because oftentimes the exceptionally rare have the best stories and the most connection um, to South Carolina. And a good example of that is the uh, uh, trillium that's so uncommon that it's known this year, there were 10 flowering individuals in the world's only known population that's threatened by feral hogs um, in a place no one can go poach it from because it's on the nuclear site in <laughs> Savannah River site um, and is not known anywhere else in any other state in any other location despite us looking as hard as we could and was under study for for description and has this beautiful paper that shows that it's a genetically new thing um, that, uh, that Susan Farmer did but it has not yet been described we still included it we included every single trillium that's found in South Carolina because everybody loves trillium we also tried to include, the same way the first book did, we tried to include um, plants we wanted to familiarize people with. They're not really rare, but they were complete, previously completely off the radar. So if you try to find another book other than the first edition that has Enothera riparia in it, it can't be found. Um, this was a species described from Nuttall, and it was, it's only found on tidal Blackwater rivers in South Carolina and North Carolina. It's on the Northeast Cape Fear, the Black River in North Carolina, the Black and Waccamaw drainage in South Carolina, and on the Edisto and nowhere else on earth. Beautiful thing, um, not at all uncommon. Um, you can see it from any bridge crossing, but up until um, I realized that it was not the same thing as Xenothera fruticosa and started to looking to figure out what it was, um, totally unknown. So scrub ghost flower, here's a plant that wasn't even known from South Carolina until the book was in progress. And Richard Pache went out to his favorite spot to take a picture of Monotropa uniflora, sent me the picture, and he said, I got, I got your, uh, it's also called Indian pipes or ghost flowers for the common one. And he says, I got your Indian pipe picture. And I opened it up and I said, well, you sure did. That's the first location for uh, anywhere north of Georgia and Florida for scrub ghost flower, Monotropa bretonii, which we've now documented um, growing at one location out in Berkeley County, in the Francis Marion National Forest. And now, largely thanks to the, this photograph that Richard took and the fact that people in North Carolina knew to start looking for it, it's also been found at Patsy Pond in Carteret County, North Carolina. So the range of this species has been greatly clarified by the production and the work that went into this book. So we're always learning new things. And um, just in case you think that, you know, oh, Patrick, he knows everything about plants. <laughs> Not hardly. Um, a plant I thought I knew really, really well is um, round leaf sundew, Drosera rotundifolia. So easy to find an, a, a plant to take a picture of those insectivorous tentacle-like leaves, right? Um, but then I started looking for flowers. And so I went to um, a place that was very close to where we had a home up in North Carolina in Allegheny County where I was raised. Um, and I knew there were thousands of them. So there was tons of buds and I'd go out in the morning and I'd look and the buds weren't open. And I'd go out at noon and the buds weren't open. I'd go back at four and they were, shriveled up, done. So I found another population. I went back out to it. I kept going all year for two years before I finally wised up and read about the plant and how it flowers. And only a small number of populations have what we call chasmogamous flowers, flowers that open up wide and are pollinated by insects, right? Most populations have what we call cleistogamous flowers. So I learned something myself about that and passed it on in the in the uh, the writing in the book to you. So if you ever get frustrated also looking for a round leaf sundew flower, you can find all the other species, but the round leaf sundew in the Carolinas is almost strictly cleistogamous. It does not produce sexually reproducing flowers. Those flowers are already packed with a little 
self-pollinated um, capsule ready to spread seeds. Um, we learned a lot about this plant um, after we wrote the book. So this is Zephyranthes. Oh God, did I put Adamasco? Oh, see, this is not Zephyranthes Adamasco. <laughs> this is Zephyranthes Simpsonii. And my my uh, apologies there, and it should say Simpsonii. Let me go back. Um, Zephyranthes Simpsonii is Florida Adamasco lily, um, and Florida Adamasco lily, at the time we wrote the book, I had seen in Georgetown County close to the coast, and I'd seen it in Charleston County right along Highway 17 near Isle of Palms cutoff, um, and I'd seen it in southeastern North Carolina growing in maritime areas. So we assumed, just like Alan Weekly assumed in his Florida, that this thing grows predominantly in maritime areas, so that's what we look for it. Um, driving back and forth to Tillman this spring, I found out it also really likes parking uh, or roadsides across from Dollar General's. I found three populations in um, Georgetown, Waynesburg, and Horry County that were all across from a Dollar General. <laughs> Don't know why, but they were. So it turns out that this plant um, is probably was much more abundant at one time because it tends to grow between swamp forests and formerly fire maintained uplands. Um, and only where you have really wet swamp forests bordering fairly dry but rich soils in the uplands. So much more widespread away from, um, from the coast. And this spring I did a, uh, a survey for uh, Keith on Zephyranthes Adamasco and managed to document that it still is extant in Hampton County. And we documented um, over a dozen populations in Northeastern South Carolina. So it is no longer critically imperiled as it says in the book. It's graduated all the way to just simply being almost extinct, just imperiled in South Carolina. Um, Dr. Rayner, I should mention, incredible contribution to both volumes of the book. Um, when you read about um, the traditional uses of these plants in the book, um, that was largely the contribution of Dr. Rayner. Uh, it was a, just an absolute honor to be able to work with one of my uh, botanical heroes, I always call him, um, that just seems to have no end to the knowledge that he has um, so, um, these topics. So when you see this uh, in the book and you'll see a lot of new things and a lot of new uses and a lot of new warnings about things like using Hypericum, um, that essentially coming from Doug, um, really fabulous contribution. He spent a lot of time trying to make my gibberish into English also and forever grateful for his massive contribution uh, as an author on this book. Um, Richard learned a thing or two. Um, I was trying to get him to put all of the pediamilums in the book and all of the orbexilums in the book. And he said, oh, they're just not, they're not interesting. They're not pretty. Nobody will ever look at that. So he went out and he took a, a picture of the flower, a buckroot eastern prairie turnip, which is quite rare in South Carolina. It's down in Allendale County, he found this. And, and uh, he thought, well, it's kind of neat. I said, yeah, but did you see what the root looks like? And he says, no. I said, well, it's also called prairie turnip, you know. I said, because Native Americans would dig that thing and has a, a sweet potato sized bulbous root. And so Richard went back down and I think with Keith Bradley and they, they found one um, to even photograph and show you guys something you don't usually see. A very well excavated massive root of Eastern prairie turnip or buckroot, Pediamillum canescens, which was an important food crop for Native Americans um, in the, the coastal plain region. We learned things that I thought I knew, um, largely because I, I also was able to spend part of my sabbatical um, thinking about this book and preparing for this book. And one of the things I did on my sabbatical was I sat underneath and around and near and in an American chestnut for about three months, all the way through it leafing out, flowering and uh, forming fruit. And, you know, this was a large stump sprout. But what I, what I didn't know, and it is known, but it's frequently misrepresented as a wind pollinated species. It's not. Chestnuts, castanias, both 
um, chinka pins and American chestnuts are pollinated by beetles. Flower tumble, tumbler beetles, longhorn beetles. I'm a, I've documented more than 70 species of beetle on this one tree and not just a few, tens and tens of thousands of beetles when this is in, in um, flower. And these beetles are coming here to feed and they're also coming here for recreation. It's not just a food, but there's a party going on too, because everybody's mating and meeting their girlfriends on this, uh, you know, out at this, this hangout. And so much is going on, so much ecological interconnection. And the numbers of beetles are so great that when you walk under one, you'll have them all over your shirt, like just, just like this leaf, just covered in beetles, if you're ever lucky enough to see an American chestnut with this many flowers on it. Well, think about the choices that people have made in the past that led to the loss, ecologically at least, of American chestnut in our forests. And then think about the fact that when you read about Pine Oak Heath, Montane Oak Forest, Piedmont Oak Forest, that much of that largely was American chestnut. And then think about the impact on our beetle population, which must have had an enormous impact on the bird population on the woodpecker population, on everything that depends on beetles. All right, well, so another bit of information we put into this book is, um, I know a lot of you guys are love butterflies and I'm, I'm more now on trying to get people to make more beetles, but <laughs> um, if, if plants are good larval food uh, hosts for uh, popular butterflies, that, that information's in there. So may pops, passion flower, incredibly important um, indigenous food to indigenous people here in the Southeast and still good to eat if you find a ripe one, pop it open and eat the little fleshy arils on the seeds on the inside. It's passion fruit, just a native one, free. You don't even have to pay for it at the grocery store. And it's also very tasty to things like gulf fritillaries, zebra long wings and variegated fritillaries. So we tried to include um, as much information as we had space to in this book um, on those things. So just a couple other little um, highlights uh, from the book. Um, there's a lot of new South Carolina plants since the last edition, or some that were some, some of these were published before the last edition, but in the last 25 or 30 years and may not have made the last edition. One of those is endemic to the upstate of uh, South Carolina and southern. Uh, West Virginia, Western Virginia, and Eastern Kentucky. It's a very odd distribution. Gorge Goldenrod, Solidago fossibus. It was discovered by Tom Weebold up in the Virginias in Kentucky and discovered by me on my first day of work at Clemson. It was really amazing. Went out to Peach Orchard Branch with, um, with um, uh, one of the, the professors that I worked with there. And he showed me um, Peach Orchard Branch and I saw this huge leaf that looked like a skunk cabbage but I thought must be an aster or goldenrod. It took me three years to find it flowering. But when I did, I was like, oh my God, this is a, a totally new species of goldenrod with leaves the size of skunk cabbage. And Tom was already working on describing this plant, which is a decaploid, 10 sets of chromosomes. Really amazing. It's not many decaploid goldenrods. And um, he named it Solidigo fossibus. But uh, we are suspicious now that the plant in Virginia and West Virginia and Kentucky is not exactly the same as the one in South Carolina. So don't be surprised if this has a new name by the time we get around to a second revised edition of the book. Um, a lot of South Carolinians have been honored uh, for their contribution. Um, a lot of good South Carolina Native Plant Society members and um, good friends of the Native Plant Society. So a few that we've named in the last couple of years, um, this one, Sheely's Mountain Lettuce after Harry Sheely uh, from Aiken, South Carolina. Um, very closely related a variety of the way that it was interpreted by um, my student, Larry Cushman, uh, of the more widespread Petiolaris, which we just call Michos or Cliff Saxifrage. But Cliff Saxifrage has um, distinctly zygomorphic flowers, irregular, and Chile's regular. Chile's is mostly an annual that blooms February through May. Glissatsifrage, a perennial blooming May through August. One is itsy bitsy, one is a great big thing, right? So pretty cool um, to have a plant named after 
Dr. Sheely, really pleased that we were able to do that. And a, even a plant named after Porsche. And I bugged him about this one because this is a ragweed. Richard Porsche only has one, has this one plant and it's Porsche's ragweed. Now it has low country charm to it because the leaves smell like gardenia when you crush them. And Richard, believe it or not, discovered this plant without knowing it because the first time I took him to the type location for this plant, Richard was walking down the rock outcrop and he kicked this thing. He said, Pat, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I walked over and I really didn't know what it was because it was the middle of summer, but it smelled like gardenia. And if it hadn't been for Richard kicking and, and wondering what kind of weed he was stepping on, we wouldn't know anything about Porsche's ragweed today. Turns out it's a very highly localized endemic found only at um, four sites in the Blue Ridge Escarpment of only South Carolina, Pickens and um, Greenville County. And you can see that very population up um, in Table Rock State Park uh, growing on Table Rock outcrop. All right, and another one, this one described uh, uh, just a couple years ago as well, the Carolina hedge nettle, Statues Caroliniana, um, by John Nelson and Doug Rayner. So we hadn't been doing nothing when they're not writing the, the wildflower book. They've been discovering new species of plants as well. You know, uh, this one highly distinctive, endemic to just uh, a couple sites in the low country of South Carolina um, and has sessile leaves. So very easily told from Florida hedge nettle. The way this book came together, um, Richard, as the predominant uh, photographer for the book, he took well over half of the photographs um, that are in the, the Wildflower book. Um, Richard was gung-ho, so gung-ho. I, I wanna show you a picture that I took of him taking a photograph of an asplenium on a rock outcrop in South Carolina, but I can't find a picture and I think he destroyed it because I was holding up, holding up him from the backside on the side of a cliff on a rock while he was leaning sideways taking a picture while I was standing on a, a little rock myself. It's ridiculous what you had to go to, to to take some of these photographs. Right here, Richards is getting ready to hang off this rock backwards to take a photograph of um, Polypodium virginianum. So uh, here's the, the very picture that Richard got in that ridiculous uh, episode I was just telling you about. Um, Ed Pivorin, a very good and close colleague of mine, um, <clears throat> has the second highest numbers of photograph credits in this book and um, is incredibly dedicated um, to wildlife and wildflower photography. He's worked for me and with me for years um, on the TV show. And uh, I, we could not have done the, the wildflower book without um, the incredible talent, passion, and love of wildflowers that Ed Pavorn has. I know most of you know Ed. He, uh, he very generously allowed us to use many photographs in this book and went out purposely to take photographs. We lost one of the greats of um, photography, period, in my opinion, and one of the greats of human beings, in my opinion, too. Um, God, it's been two years now, I guess, um, since uh, Jim Fowler passed away before he did. Uh, Jim very generously. Um, loaned us the use of, of some of the most beautiful photographs that he had taken. And it was quite an honor to have, um, have Jim's work in our book. And what will probably be everybody's favorite photograph and sits right on the inside cover, a very beautiful photograph of Lilium pyrophyllum, an endemic to the Sandhill seepage slopes of the North and South Carolina um, with a ruby-throated hummingbird pollinating it as only Will Stewart could get. Will is an incredibly talented photographer who um, mostly photographs the interactions of insects and pollinators with plants. Um, Alan Kressler, an incredible and intrepid um, explorer and photographer who spends time throughout the Southeastern US and I've been watching, he's even out in, in the West, Western US right now doing some photography. And our state botanist, Keith Bradley, who is one of the most generous people in the world donating us photographs. So once you get into a natural community, um, the plants within that community are, are, when you flip through, we'll start out with the largest things first. So the trees are in the first part of this uh, habitat, uh, the shrubs second, 
beyond that, the, the uh, herbaceous plants, according to their season of bloom. So the earliest blooming, like round leaf violet, shuttleworth, uh, wild ginger, um, and then later in the year, things like coral oryza, odontoryza, autumn coral root. So they're arranged by the season of bloom. And then beyond that, you'll find ferns. So um, that's the way within each one. By the way, what habitat do you think I was dealing with there? This would be an acidic co-forest, the black birch, the hamamelis, the eubotrus, which used to be a leucothi, um, vertidendron maximum, and herbs that tolerate very highly acidic soils. Um, for many plants that are confusingly similar, we didn't just choose one, we chose both and we put them both in the same plate. So for instance, rock cat ferns, we have two species. Their ranges completely overlap, Greenville, Spartanburg, Oconee, and Pickens County. And one is widest towards the middle and does not have a long tip and is shorter. The other one widest towards the base, extends out to a very long tip. Um, this one is a polyploid, polypodium Appalachianum. This one's a diploid, polypodium virginianum, and it's rare to see both pictured together. We tried to do that as often as we could um, with the plants that are in this book. So um, camellias, we don't have these together, but we included all the species. Um, Rexia, every species in South Carolina is uh, included in the book. And when you have ones that are um, difficult to ID, like Maryland Meadow Beauty and Virginia Meadow Beauty, and I say, the way you tell the difference is one has a square stem, one doesn't have a square stem. Well, guess what? This is the actual image from the book. You can very clearly see the square stem on the Maryland Meadow Beauty. You can see it has a groove, but it does not have a square stem. It says you tell it from Nashii because the hypanthium has hairs on it, and the hypanthium and Nashii is also pictured without hairs on it. So the characters you need are there. And if they are very closely related in the same habitat and look confusingly similar. There'll be an A and a B so that you can see the white back to the white leaf or silver leaf hydrangea and the lack of it and the lack of the sterile florets on hydrangea arborescence. So we tried to do this and tried to include plants that would be of interest to everyone, like this plant. Plants that are of interest to real um, hardcore wildflower lovers, plant lovers like these two. Um, and it's not very often you'll open up a wildflower book and see both of these pictured side by side, Bryodesma tortopilum and Bryodesma rupestri. Um, you can find them both in the upstate of South Carolina rock outcrops. If you ever wondered what the difference was when they say that the white hairs are twisted in tortopilum and they're straight in rupestri, we picture that as well so that you can see the habit difference and the difference in the key characteristic. Um, we even included plants that maybe only I would be interested in seeing the difference of. <laughs> Real hardcore people would want to know the difference between Eupatorium morii, the polyploid, and Eupatorium recurvens, uh, the diploid. But um, it's visible, it's there. We went to great lengths to make sure it was. Um, a lot of uh, shortcuts to identification too. If you're not out at the time of year when the angle pods are blooming on a big plant, because only about one in a hundred of these will ever make a flower. The rest of them just kind of crawl around in the forest. You'll never know whether you have a species of gonolobus or a species of metelia just from sight alone, unless you see the flowers. So what do you do? Well, thankfully you have someone as smart as, as Doug Rayner who says, oh yeah, well, that's easy, Patrick. You just squish the leaf. If it smells like peanut butter, it's gonolobus. If it doesn't, it's metelia. So there's little tricks for ID are included throughout the book as well. Um, and then plants that um, have value, uh, both for their ecological contribution as well as the contribution to your landscape. So this is a, um, a species that I rediscovered for South Carolina. It was collected by Henry William Ravenel in Berkeley County, South Carolina, and named for Ravenel, Ringium ravenellii, a Torian gray. And um, then lost. When they flooded Lake Moultrie, pretty much we thought that it was all gone. Well, I rediscovered this plant back in the early 2000s um, in Charleston County, South Carolina, growing in South Carolina. It's common in Florida. I mean, the Carolinas, it's just South Carolina, just known from Berkeley and Charleston today. And then 
each year we're finding more and more populations of this in Berkeley County and Charleston County. Um, beautiful plant, one of the best pollinator plants you'll ever plant in a garden. And even though it grows on the edges of um, wetland savannas that are fire maintained, um, if you grow it in a pitcher plant bog, it'll barely survive. If you grow it in a wetland, it'll barely survive. If you grow it in regular garden soil, it looks exactly like what you see on the right here. It's an example of a plant that does better in a garden than it does in its native habitat <laughs> under different conditions than it's able to compete in in the wild. Um, so this is a great example of one of those things that I think everybody should be growing in the upstate of South Carolina because it's, it's heat tolerant. It looks great. It flowers late July and August, a time of year when we don't have a lot of other things blooming in our garden. And it supports a huge number of native flies, bees, halictids, and wasps. That's one of those near natives to the upstate, fully native down in the low country and connections all the way back to Henry William Ravenel. Well, guys, I want to leave you with the thought that the, the state is changing um, and we've got a massive challenge ahead. Um, the state is, is changing in this climate, no question. Um, it's not even open for argument. Our weather's just crazy. Every year is, uh, is a little nuttier than the one before. Um, we've went a long time with fire suppression in many of our, our forest systems and fire's gonna reclaim that. So it, we have a massive challenge ahead and it can only be solved by um, groups like yours, ours, the South Carolina Native Plant Society um, that are willing to invest the time, um, the process and the intellect and growth of their intellect into understanding what's happening how the world arranges itself and, and, and what part we have always had to play in the beautiful flowers that are around us. So we had a fire up on Table Rock several years ago um, on Pinnacle Mountain, which is where this is. And it was through one of the, the most amazing wildflower sites that I'd ever run across, a, what we call a mafic um, cataract fen. So a very unusual, uh, rock outcrop and rock type and seepage water across this high magnesium rock type that grows plants that are hard to see anywhere else in South Carolina. So we went up there in particular looking to photograph for the book and I was interested to see how that massive fire had changed um, Pinnacle Mountain in the Long Ridge. And what we saw was um, fire was damn good for Packer millifolia. That plant we were talking about growing up on Glassy Mountain and being wiped out by Packer Anonima, Anonima introgressing with it that we spoke about before the talk began. Um, here it is in all its glory and the population has exploded with all of the newly exposed shallow soil, bare rock and sunlight that the fire brought into the habitat. There's much more Packer millifolia, divided leaf ground cell up on, on Pinnacle Mountain today. Um, Another rare plant, um, Amorpha glabra, which is also in the book, it's a picture from the book, um, with the smooth leaves and the beautiful purple flowers, um, a small shrub that needs high light, needs high magnesium in the soil, grows on glassy mountain here and there, and it's everywhere since the fire on Pinnacle Mountain. The cataract fen got burned, oh my goodness. <laughs> It is a jumble of things today, um, not like this photograph that I took back in 2002, but even with that jumble, uh, providing fresh and new habitat, new ground uh, for all those things that I found there before, uh, including shrubby St. John's wort. Oh, we have most of the, the outcrop St. John's worts are in the book. Lindernia monticola and beautiful population of uh, the red Canada lily which is hard to see in South Carolina, but here and there, and not that rare, just frequently hiding out as little sterile leaves waiting for the light that a fire would provide to allow it to come and pop into bloom in that rich soil um, that had been forest that turned into open woodland. Um, just show you what, what David could do. We were there too late to get a photograph of this plant, which is also rare. Um, the last place I know where it grows in South Carolina is there on Long Ridge. And this is a picture I took years ago. You see how terrible that picture is? David White cleaned that up to make it look like that in the book. 
because <laughs> he really had talent. So we're part of the we're part of this place, and that's really you'll notice uh, over and over again. I've been talking about today. We're part of this place, and we're always learning more. And this is not the end. Um, you know, the do all end all. I can't wait till somebody comes along and finds two or three hundred more plants and has to write another book and a book better than this one and a book without the mistakes that I made in this one and you know and all of that. Um, and just to show you, here we are, Lake Jacassi, just a couple years ago. It was Kay Wade takes me up to see a Pelea that she had found. And not only had she found a Pelea, she'd found Astrolepis sinuata, first location for South Carolina, that far from its regular range. Not just one did she find, she found a whole side of this rock face full, over 250 crowns of Astrolepis sinuata, the first record for South Carolina, and tens of thousands of stems of Wright's Cliff Break the first real record for South Carolina, and not one, but tens of thousands way out here when it should be grown over here, also known from Alexander County and Gaston County, but that only 60 plants in North Carolina. We have over 100,000 or so in the upstate of South Carolina on that population. And even copper fern, Bomria hispida. Look at how far away. First record for Eastern North America. And if I hadn't been, if I, if I hadn't been so stubborn, I would have gone to the quarry where these plants are found on Lake Jocassi and seen them far before uh, I did, but I just was stubborn. I thought I knew everything there was to know about how humans and plants interacted. I thought I knew that there's no way you could find a fern like this in a place that you can watch a mountain, you can watch this mountain being blown up at a minute and 16 seconds into the, the movie Deliverance. There was nothing left. It was bare rock. It was a quarry. It's highly disturbed. And it's providing habitat today, right? 48, 50 years later, um, it's providing habitat to some of the rarest ferns that call South Carolina home. So I hope you guys really enjoy the book. You'll notice um, a lot of work went into getting incredible um, photographs for this thing. And more than anything, I, I just hope that, um, that if you, if you do take the book and, and spend any time using it, reading it, that you start to look, at least for my contribution to this book, I'd like you to start to look at where our hands should be in this world and how we should be working together to reclaim our historical place with dirty hands right there as part of our natural communities. So thank you guys so much for listening to me. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> I do want to uh, ask you a few questions that we have uh, from our uh, chat box. Yep. Uh, one, of, one of them was, uh, where can you find spring wildflowers in mass in South Carolina? That could be a lot of answers, I believe. <laughs> It's a lot of answers. What Chestnut Ridge Heritage Preserve is pretty awful nice. Um, I do like also, uh, you know, Station Cove. There's a lot of people go to Station Cove. Stay on the trail. Don't stomp the trillium. Um, but those are two well-known places. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I've sort of stopped doing is telling people, hey, this is a great place to go see wildflowers. Go explore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, a lot Enjoy of your places, own expedition. <laughs> yeah, a lot of places that I used to say, hey, go see the wildflowers. Today, I can't find a parking spot to go see the wildflowers myself. But um, there's no bad place. But, you know, our heritage preserve system in South Carolina is there to provide a shelter and a home to the, the rare natural elements of our state. And it is, uh, they're generally developed in a way that allows you to get in there and look at them. The trails are developed um, to take you to see those natural features. I would just beg and implore you when you're there to leave everything there the way you see it um, and to, to always be, um, be present in the moment and understand that we, we only want to, we don't even want to leave footsteps. We want our, our presence in the place to be, um, to be clean when we leave it and for every one of those flowers that was there when we got there to still be there when we leave it. Yeah. And Matt Johnson was asking about the least trillium in Aiken, uh, the Nuker plant. Is it different from the Carolina least trillium? 
It is. Yeah. Matt Johnson has, uh, has the I mean, lion's share of the Carolina Lee's Trillium down there at the Audubon, uh, Francis Beadler. But uh, it is different. Its uh, stem is uh, taller. It has leaves that are, um, you know, they're head, held farther above the ground. They're more uh, outright and the flower is more uh, erect than Carolina Lee's Trillium. It's a very different looking plant than okay. the plants you see over at Beadler Forest. Yeah. And there was a question about the uh, impact of these retention ponds, like like Dollar General you're mentioning, uh, uh, these, <laughs> the places that have these retention ponds. How does that in, impact our flora? Well, retention ponds can be really great native plant habitat. Um, and they can be really lousy. It depends on what's going into the retention pond and how the water leaves the retention pond. Um, you know, there's... I've, I've been part of projects um, dealing with storm water um, and creating incredible um, native, you know, man-made native communities of things that, that have massive um, positive benefit to, um, to wildlife. The, in the eastern U.S., retention ponds aren't really the problem they are out west. Um, out west, stock ponds, retentions, anything that, that is changing the water flow can be catastrophic to the entire ecosystem. In South Carolina, as long as it's infiltrating into the groundwater and it's not changing the course of a small stream, um, they can be good places. They can be wildlife habitat and they can be plant habitat. So I, I wanted to report to you on our uh, survey of the um, Black Hole Heritage Preserve, we found, we found lots of these uh, short-leaf sneezeweeds, the Helena brevifolium out there. Oh, awesome. So that, that would be another another location. That's awesome, yeah. That. Uh, and there was a question from a Facebook group. Uh, by the way, we had the 100 people on, on Zoom and, and 42 uh, on Facebook. So that, that's a good crowd tonight. But another question from Facebook is, how do you see the role of the nursery trade in the native plant conservation? Great question. So I think um, two things, <laughs> maybe more than two. The nursery trade um, can play a really staggeringly important role in um, conservation. Um, the big problem in the nursery trade is that it's difficult to make money. And it's difficult to make money doing the things that we do, that we like. Um, it's a lot easier to grow something that everybody's going to plant and that grows easy and that has no pests and that comes from China and that, you know, um, is easy to show at Lowe's, uh, or Home Depot stands up good in the stands. Um, that's where big money is at. So we really have to change, um, a culture, it has to be a cultural shift within the nursery industry. And there also has to be more dialogue between the conservation groups, the native plant societies, and the nursery industry. Um, I think today, a lot of people look at the nursery industry as villains in the native plant society, and people in the, in the nursery trade are really confused why, since we know how to grow plants um, really, really well, why we're not working more closely with the conservation community. Um, now part of that is the desire, I think, of the conservation community to be perfect. I know as a member of the conservation community, I want to be very, very sure that I'm making the right choice with everything I do when I'm managing a population of rare plants or when I'm you know, considering reintroducing um, genes into a, a certain population of plants. I mean, these are things we really worry about. Um, meanwhile, the world is freaking on fire, right? Um, like I can tell you <laughs> just in the time, from the time that we wrote the first book to this book, to go back to places like one of the most amazing savannas I've ever been in, in two or three of the most amazing savannas I've ever been in, in Williamsburg County. And you go back today, um, huge population of Schwalbe in one, huge population of, um, uh, Terriglis aspis and Schwalbe and the other, and masses of Plotanthra and Nivea and Schwalbe and Terriglis aspis and the other. And you go back today, and all three of them are sweet gum, uh, subsoil, and loblolly pine head high. So we worry a lot 
about being perfect, I think, a lot more than we should. And we're not worried enough about making sure that the freaking things we care about are actually surviving. They're actually there. Um, so we try to control, I think, in conservation. I mean, we like to think of a few people having control over the fate of a lot of species because they, I know best. I know exactly what should be done. And I think we need a lot more input and a lot more dialogue from people who have knowledge on the ground, from people who manage land, from people who are in native plant societies, and from people who are in nurseries. Because there's, they're like smooth coneflower is a heck of a plant. It's a great plant in the garden. It has everything that we need for supporting biodiversity in South Carolina. Um, but it's also federally threatened. Um, so it's, its use is greatly curtailed. Are we doing ourselves any good by that? Um, would you rather have people plant purple coneflower next to the smooth coneflower and lose a, lose a population than take the one in a million chance that somebody might mistakenly uh, believe that somewhere somebody planted a coneflower is actually a natural population or that um, you're going to pollute the genes of a, of a coneflower from a county county with genes from Allendale County? <laughs> You know, it, we don't even know if that's a bad thing. So I, I, I really get frustrated sometimes um, that there's not more dialogue and that even when we are growing plants that we're not doing things like trying to support nurserymen by saying, okay, rather than, than trying to grow these at the forest service or trying to grow these at the university by some student who's no experience whatsoever, why don't we contract the nursery industry to do it? They can do it really, really well. Um, and I think they'd like to, as the only problem is that that's the way that the nursery industry makes a living. And if they're really good at doing it and they make a living doing it, if you're really good as an accountant, but you're working as an accountant for the Nature Conservancy, you still get paid. Um, so until we can kind of fix that, I think there's a lot of tension there. I'd, I'd love to see that, um, that work closer together. I'd love to see the demand be not for a perfect plant, but for a plant that has ecosystem value and benefit, one with holy leaves, one that had spots on it, one that, um, you know, belonged where you were putting it and one going to get out of place. But until that market develops, um, it's really hard to support a nursery on that alone. Mm. Yeah, and uh, what do you think would be a good contact for a, for a new record? Would that be like Keith Bradley or Sam? Definitely. Absolutely. The, the contact, if you find a new record, new rare plant. What, what I do, like I, I just did a whole survey of Tillman Sandridge. I, all my collections are on my phone. <laughs> this, is, this is what you do. If you have an iPhone, you turn on your location on your, your, under your photos so that you're taking a GPS reading with your photograph. You take a picture of that plant, you can tell where exactly you saw it, you can see it on the map, and you send that to the Department of Natural Resources Heritage Trust Program, and Keith Bradley is your man. All right. Don't, don't pick it. Take a picture. <laughs> and uh, if you want to start with a field full of invasives and go to a, one of the wildflowers, how do you do that? Field full of invasives to, to a meadow garden? Yes. I, nobody's going to like the answer. <laughs> um, it depends. <laughs> that's a that's a whole uh, that's a whole class. But um, if you're on rich soil, um, you, you know you're going to have to remove. Regardless, you have to remove the invasives. And so, honest to God, the the least impactful, best practice in doing that, as much as I hate it, is spray it. You spray it once, you get it gone, you replace it as soon as you possibly can with, with good productive things and that works. Um, if you have rich soil, you need to plug and plant. If you have poor clay soils, you might be able to seed drill and plant a cover crop for the first year. But um, the, the big lesson everybody has to learn about doing meadow gardens that nobody seems to get is you can only do what you can plant thickly that year. So if you go out and you, you clear an acre and you only have enough money to plant a hundred square feet and you spread that hundred square feet out over the acre, the whole thing fails. So 